What we'd like to do now is uh, go through some of the financial and otherwise considerations of why fuzzing is a good idea. So uh, fuzzing is going to save money, but ultimately it can save more than that. And to understand this, uh, we're going to start out by looking at the life of a typical bug. And we'll look at actually three different lifetimes of a bug. Uh, the first one being by far the worst. And um, just because it's the worst uh, doesn't mean it's an outlier or something that happens seldom. Uh, it actually happens all the time. So I'm going to walk you through how this bug lives and dies. And a bug, uh, it's just a mistake made by a developer. So the bug's life starts when the developer makes that mistake uh, during some product development. And again, um, let's not beat up on the developers because uh, all developers make mistakes no matter how good they are, and we're, we're trying to improve the process around them. So the bug is born, and uh, as this product moves through its uh, testing cycle, uh, the bug is not found. So uh, maybe they're not testing enough, maybe they're not using fuzzing, but for whatever reason, they don't see this bug. And so the bug goes into the released product, and at the point that the product is released, we now call this bug a zero-day vulnerability. It's an unknown vulnerability. Nobody knows about it right now. Until, at some point later in time, uh, an attacker or a black hat of some kind finds this bug. So maybe they're doing fuzzing in their secret hacker lab, and they find this vulnerability. And then they do some more work on it, and maybe they're able to create an exploit for that bug. And that means that they're able to send an input to this product or this piece of software uh, that allows them to run their own code inside, uh, through that vulnerability uh, inside that product. And then the attacker finds a way to deploy this exploit. And at this point, bad things are really starting to happen. So for example, uh, money can be stolen, intellectual property can, property can be stolen, and the attacker uh, starting from compromised uh, devices can launch further attacks. The bad stuff uh, even goes up to the point of death and destruction, which I know sounds like hyperbole, but it's really not. So um, you can go look up at the FDA website uh, and find documented cases where software bugs uh, not through malicious intent, but just accidentally. Software bugs have caused patient death uh, with certain types of medical devices. And uh, there are other examples where uh, software uh, malware has introduced uh, physical damage uh, in devices that are attached to computers. So death and destruction sounds, uh, sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. And then at some point later, um, whoever it was that's been compromised or fell victim to this exploit figures out that something bad has happened. And the exact time that elapses between the attack and when it's discovered varies. But uh, on average, it's an alarmingly long time. But at some point, the attack is discovered, and uh, then Hopefully, computer security experts get involved and do some detective work and figure out and trace this attack back to whatever vulnerability it was that the attacker exploited. And then at that point, the bug is no longer called a zero day. It's now called a known vulnerability. And it gets added to these uh, CVE lists and uh, other lists where known vulnerabilities are documented. But um, at this point, the expense and trouble is tremendous. Okay. So um, once the attack is discovered and publicized, there's uh, reputation damage, which can be irreparable to uh, the victim organization as well as the builder organization. Uh, and of course, the entire process has been extremely expensive, uh, both in terms of losses from the crime itself as well as uh, just the effort involved in investigating and trying to clean everything up. But the bug is now uh, a known vulnerability. And so uh, the vendor can fix it in their source code. And they can release a patched version of their software or their product uh, to all their customers. 
and the antivirus definitions can be updated, and the IDS definitions can be updated, and it's now a known vulnerability. This is the absolutely worst case, and uh, it happens all the time. So uh, a better lifetime of a bug um, is this one, where the bug is born as usual. Some developer makes a mistake. The bug is missed during product testing and gets released uh, and is now a zero day in that product. And then a good guy finds the bug. So instead of uh, an attacker or, uh, or some adversary finding the bug, uh, maybe the buyer organization uh, finds the bug by doing fuzzing in their lab. Or uh, maybe some researcher, some security researcher finds it. Uh, and in either case, uh, they can responsibly disclose this vulnerability back to the software vendor. And, and when I say responsibly, basically I mean discreetly. You know, they, they um, do the right thing and keep it quiet and work with the vendor to get it fixed. Uh, and then the vendor can fix that in the software. They can release a patch. They, and the antivirus updates and the IDS updates can happen. And then at some point, uh, this information will go public, and there may be reputation damage for the builder. Uh, so this is a better uh, lifetime of a bug. You know, There's less bad stuff happening. But it's still pretty expensive, both for the buyer and for the builder. The best case of a bug lifetime is somebody writes a bug, makes a mistake, and the testing team catches it. And the bug gets fixed and the product is released without the bug. This is the best possible lifetime of a bug. So the value proposition for builder organizations is very straightforward. Uh, so this diagram shows the typical software development uh, life cycle of a product. The box on the left represents the product in development, and you can see the bugs hiding in there. And uh, what more, what most builder organizations do is uh, positive testing or functional testing. And here, uh, they're just making sure that the software works the way it's supposed to work. So they send valid inputs to it and make sure the right thing happens. And that's fine. That, that's important. Uh, and as they move this product through the release cycle, they find uh, some bugs uh, d by doing this positive or functional testing, and they fix those bugs. So the box on the right shows what the product looks like after release. And then if an attacker comes along and fuzzes this thing and tries to find vulnerabilities, it's pretty easy to locate vulnerabilities. So if the builder instead does the positive and functional testing and also does fuzzing as part of their software product development life cycle, then as they move the product through the release cycle, they'll find and fix both of those groups of bugs. And there will still be bugs in the product. There will always be bugs in the product. But it's going to be a lot harder for the attacker to locate vulnerabilities in the released product. For a buyer organization, uh, again, they're trying, they have some core business that they're trying to protect. So if, uh, if the buyer is a network operator, they provide the network as a service. And interruptions in that service are very painful for them. They're very expensive. So if they're considering using a, a certain piece of equipment to provide that service, what they can do is bring it into their test lab, do their own fuzzing on it, and then if they locate vulnerabilities in that product, they've got a couple of choices. Um, one choice is maybe they choose to use a different product that has fewer uh, vulnerabilities in it, less risk. Or maybe they can work with the vendor and say, hey, uh, we found these vulnerabilities. Would you please fix them up? because we don't want to use your product otherwise. And uh, when the vendor fixes the product uh, to their satisfaction, they've got something that they can feel much more confident about incorporating into their core business. So for builders, again, uh, there is actually a measurable return on investment. And it's just based on the idea. Uh, it's like the old proverb, a, a stitch in time saves nine. So with bugs, uh, it's so much cheaper to fix bugs earlier rather than later. So uh, you've probably all seen these graphs. And uh, estimates vary, but uh, I've seen numbers. It, it costs 
maybe 100, maybe 150 times more to fix a bug after a product's released than during uh, earlier in the development cycle. Uh, we asked Forrester Research to do a, a study on this, an ROI study, and they followed a, a major network equipment manufacturer for a three-year period. And based on the cost of the fuzzing tools and the amount uh, that they had to pay their testers and estimates about how expensive it was to fix a bug earlier or later, they calculated 176% uh, ROI over that three-year period. Uh, so you can quantify this, uh, you can make your own estimates, but fuzzing saves a builder organization money. For a buyer organization, well, it's harder to quantify, but it definitely makes sense. And it all comes back to the buyer has some core business that is critical to them. It, it's, it's their most important thing. And so fuzzing allows them to protect themselves uh, from uh, products or pieces of software that they're thinking of using in that core business. And then, of course, uh, quite aside from dollars and cents, there's a, a priceless aspect to this, uh, to the value of eradicating bugs, which is um, if an incident occurs uh, to you either as a builder or as a buyer, it can cause reputation damage that, that has no price it, and is possibly uh, unable to be repaired. And of course, there's also potential loss of life involved uh, depending on the software and the application. Thank you for watching these videos. We hope you've enjoyed them. If you want to learn more about fuzz testing, visit our website at www.codenomicon.com.